Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening and um, welcome to the 815 panel discussion. Um, we really appreciate you being here and we've got a great panel. We've got a, a great group here. And the way this is going to work is that you are, you are going to have your dinner while we, um, while we have an educated discussion up here. Um, but we're also looking forward uh, to, your questions, to your questions as well. So uh, this panel is called A New Eastern Trade Route, Integrating, Integrating the Bay of Bengal. And uh, this is a really important topic and one that we've been struggling with for many years about how to get right from an Indian perspective and from a U.S. perspective, but we have a lot of great voices here on the stage. And again, I hope you're thinking of your, of your questions as we, as we proceed in the course of the evening because we'll, we'll make this very much a, an interactive session. Let me go ahead and introduce our panelists of who we have here. Down at my uh, far right, Stephen Smith is presently Professor of Public International Law at the University of Western Australia. He's a federal member for Perth for the Australian Labor Party from March 1993 to September 2013. Over the course of his many years in public service, he served as the Minister of Defense and prior to that, of Minister of Foreign Affairs and Minister of Trade. So think about that. He's had three uh, pretty big jobs in the Australian government, defense, uh, foreign affairs, and trade. Stephen, it's great to, great to see you and thank you for being here. Uh, Next to Stephen, we have uh, Dino Patai Jalal, who is the founder of the Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia, a nonpartisan nonprofit forum launched in 2014 and an Asia fellow at the Milken Institute Asia Center. Dino is a career diplomat, a former Indonesian deputy foreign minister, a former presidential spokesperson and speechwriter, and a former ambassador to the United States from 2010 to 2014. Dino, uh, thank you for, for being here. Uh, to Dino's left, we have Erin Watson Lynn, and she is the Perth US Asia Center Senior Fellow, where she develops high-level content and leads a range of programs on Indo-Pacific issues. Erin has delivered track 1.5 and two dialogues and programs across the Indo-Pacific and represented Australia at the G20 and will lead the Australian uh, W20 delegation to Saudi Arabia. Aaron is a regular foreign affairs commentator on Australian television. Uh, next to Aaron, we have Sachin Chatravedi. He's the Director General at the Research and Information System for Developing Countries, a New Delhi-based policy research institute supported by the Government of India. He serves on the board of the Reserve Bank of India and previously was a Global Justice Fellow at the Macmillan Center for International Affairs at Yale University. He works on issues related to developmental economics, including development finance. Great to see you here. And to my immediate right, Anuradha Harath served as the former director, uh, international digital media at the Sri Lanka President's Office and the Sri Lankan government spokesperson for the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. Prior to that, she served as the director of the Sri Lanka College of Journalism. Before returning to Sri Lanka, she served as the, as the communications fellow for the US Muslim Engagement Project of the Search for Common Ground USA organization in Washington, DC. So we've, we've got a terrific panel. Let me just say, uh, this is an issue that, as I said, we've been working on. It's been a challenge for um, many years, and I, I see people in the audience here that have worked on this issue. Uh, my friend Pradeep Mehta is here, who held two conferences while I served as ambassador in Calcutta. As we were trying to figure out this connectivity issue that, uh, through uh, the eastern route uh, on connectivity, and what the U.S. role could be, and, and we, really, we really struggled with that. But Pradeep, thank you for all the time and energy you put into it. We've been thinking about what a common set of values looks like uh, for the nations that have this, this trade potential. I know Dan Twining is here from the International Republican Institute. 
and uh, works on democracy and democracy-related issues. And it's a theme we should talk about, whether we can have connectivity on a, on a set of values and, and democratic nations as well. Um, but Stephen, I'm going to jump right in here and uh, ask you to kick us off here. Um, you know, Australia has a, a unique uh, vantage point around the emerging trade routes developing across the Indo-Pacific, especially within the Bay of Bengal. I mean, what do you see as the, the key drivers of connectivity and commerce within the regional economy? And how does Australia assess the potential flashpoints or challenges shaping the region? Well, I think firstly, the, 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 the Bay of Bengal uh, economic arc, if I can describe it as that, to me is really a subset of the Indo-Pacific. And so the potential for the Bay of Bengal explains why, from an Australian perspective, for the last decade or more, we've been describing uh, our part of the world as the Indo-Pacific, not the Asia-Pacific. And Sergei Lavrov this morning was questioning that, and the answer is quite straightforward, is that if you fast forward to the midpoint of this century, 2050, 30 years away, um, on current projections, uh, China will be the world's largest economy, India the second largest economy, the United States the third largest economy, and Indonesia the fourth largest economy. So Australia has had the view for some time that if that's going to be the shape of our economic world, and generally it's the case that strategic, political, military and defence heft follows economic weight, then we should start to think strategically about the Indo-Pacific rather than the Asia-Pacific. Asia In the Bay of Bengal, which is the largest bay of the world, you've got another great element, which is the proximity or the joining between those two great economies and two great democracies, Indonesia and India. So from an Australian perspective, and we've been urging our own country and our own strategists and our own foreign policy activists for more than a decade to look west. Um, looking west from Australia, you see the Indian Ocean, you see the Bay of Bengal, you see the arc of the changing world, which is driven by primarily India and Indonesia. From a, a selfish Australian perspective, if you look at the potential of the Bay of Bengal, firstly, you've got India's east coast, so you've got great economic centres like Chennai and Calcutta. From a Aust Western Australian perspective, and I come from the west coast, we have a sister state relationship with Andhra Pradesh. So from our perspective, there are plenty of contact points where you can grow an economic relationship with the eastern part of the Indian coast. And there's also, whilst at the moment you regard them as developing economies, there's also great potential in Bangladesh and Myanmar. But there's also great potential in the proximity between India and Indonesia. And this is one of the reasons why Australia uh, has argued for some time that one of the mechanisms we should develop in a changing world and in the Indo-Pacific is a trilateral arrangement which has got India, Indonesia and Australia in it. And we have that developed uh, at, uh, uh, at uh, a lower level stage in terms of our official uh, c connections. In terms of challenges, I think they're the same challenges that we face generally. Um, we, we now see uh, a much more assertive China. We have policy uncertainty from the United States. We have strategic competition between those two great powers. Uh, and uh, we're going through a period of adjustment uh, and trying to deal with that strategic competition. In the blink of an eye, that strategic competition will be joined by India. So what accommodations will China uh, and to a lesser extent the United States need to make to a third great power rising uh, in our midst? And so we have to deal with, uh, with those issues. Uh, they're the same issues that we face and more generally, and, and I'm sure other panelists will address it, we've got broader great challenging issues, whether it's climate change, uh, non-state actors and terrorism and the like. But, It'll be the same issues which challenge us generally, which will see the challenges facing those literal states in the Bay of Bengal. Steve, let me just um, press you a little bit on, you know, the potential of South Asia and Australia economic cooperation. Do 
do you think there's enthusiasm within Aus Australia? I mean, are people thinking about how can we build more connectivity to South Asia, or have they got their hands full with what's happening in East Asia and Southeast Asia? No, no, well, well, Australia at the moment, in my view, for our own long-term economic prosperity, have to engage in what I describe as project diversification. At the moment, we have uh, we're a great trading nation. We've, be we've been become a prosperous nation because we are a great trading nation and we're an attractive place for overseas foreign investment. But we need to diversify. We need to diversify a small range of minerals and petroleum resource commodities which go to North Asia, whether it's China, whether it's Japan, whether it's Korea. And that's essentially been the backbone of Australia's economy since the post-World War II years. And we need to diversify. And so at the moment, with India, for example, Australia recently in, engaged Peter Varghese, a former High Commissioner to India and a former Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, to do an Australian economic study on India's economy and the potential which exists for Australian business. Uh, and that was published uh, late 2018. The Indian government, through Ambassador Anil Wadwa, is currently doing its own study on the Australian economy, and that's due to be released shortly. So both India and Australia are starting to come to grips with and grapple with how can we make the economic connectivity between our two nations better so that from Australia's perspective, we grow our trade and investment relationship with India and put that in the long term onto the same level as we have with the United States and China and Japan, our traditional trade and investment uh, nations. Can, I, can, I, can, can Australia have... Uh its biggest trading relationship with China and have a very dynamic trading relationship with India, or do choices have to be well, made? Well, absolutely. At the moment, our two most important economic partners are on the one hand the United States, because when you combine our trade with the United States together with our investment, two-way investment with the United States, is actually our single most important economic partner, and then our greatest and most important trading partner is China. So we're able to have a deep economic relationship with those two strategic, strategic uh, uh, um, competitors. And there's no reason why we can't diversify that and also have deep trade and investment relationships, firstly with India, but also it's, uh, it's essential that Australia develops the same depth of our trade and investment relationship with Indonesia. Uh, and developing the depth of those relationships is, in my view, the single most important uh, foreign policy and economic challenge that Australia has uh, and we need to put both those two countries into the same level of economic engagement that we have with the United States and China. Great, thank you so much. Um, Dino, a, a lot of um, comments there about Indonesia but also you know you have a lot of experience with ASEAN <coughs> and ASEAN has been uh, I think from all observations are a great success, obviously. But South Asia, in contrast, has been exceptionally um, slow on interconnectivity, on trade within South Asia. Um, I wonder if you can say a little bit about your ASEAN experience, maybe related to BIMSTEC, and maybe for those people who don't use BIMSTEC as a, a regular uh, kind of word in conversation, um, give us a sense of, of what we can learn from ASEAN. Okay. Well, uh, first, I think, uh, I, I don't know how many people know BIMSTEC, but BIMSTEC is short for Bay of Bengal Initiative for Multi-Sectoral Technical and Economic Cooperation. It's a terrible name, I have to say, <laughs> right? Uh, I think it was invented uh, 20 years ago, and whoever came up with that name, I think didn't have an ear for uh, public relations, right? <laughs> uh, so, so, you know, I wish it could be called just Bay of Bengal Cooperation or Community, BBC or something, you know, right? Uh, but in any case, uh, I think uh, it's being revived or, or it's being uh, solidified and, and strengthened in recent years by India, uh, thanks for India's leadership. And I think it's a very interesting project for both sub-regional and inter-regional uh, cooperation because uh, it tries to connect parts of South Asia and parts of uh, Southeast Asia. And uh, the 
interesting thing about it is that I think it's going to be a promising part of the building block that is the Indo-Pacific. Right? Uh, Indonesia used to see Indo-Pacific in terms of uh, treaty-based uh, uh, aim, but then we changed it uh, in the last five years to become more as a building block. Right? And we think that uh, you know, ASEAN uh, plus this and that and plus this BIMSTEC uh, uh, and SARC of, uh, also can possibly uh, promote a uh, the Indo-Pacific that we want, right? Now, uh, the potential of BIMSTEC is there. Uh, 1.5 billion people, $3 trillion of economy, 22% uh, of the world population. So it has the right elements, right? Uh, but, uh, yeah, what is important is uh, we need to be clear-eyed about it. Uh, first, in terms of ASEAN, uh, what is important uh, is making sure there is good political will. You know, ASEAN started in 1967 uh, with the five countries and the leaders pushed it. Yeah? Uh, and it wasn't about economics. It was uh, about uh, getting the political equation right. And after that, the economic cooperation, the strategic cooperation and so on uh, evolved. So I think that's the challenge for BIMSTEC now, uh, how, despite India's leadership, do you make sure that the five countries or so of BIMSTEC has the same political will? Right? Uh, you talk about values. Uh, is this going to be a relationship based on values? Right? Uh, in the ASEAN case, values wasn't so uh, central uh, because ASEAN is about political diversity. Uh, rather than uniformity, and that's what made it work. Uh, and uh, in the BIMSTEC, uh, that needs to be asked as well. Uh, but the other challenge uh, is uh, also, look, we have a lot of schemes where complementarity looks promising, but in the end, it took a long time to develop into something substantial. Uh, when I was working for the Indonesian government, and we handle ASEAN, we had this IMT GT, right? Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, growth uh, triangle. And then there's a BIM IAGA, Brunei, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, East Asia, growth area, right? So, you know, all these abbreviations, right? But, you know, uh, six years I worked for the president's office, I wrote the same speeches, right? Because it didn't grow. It didn't grow in a phenomenal, uh, it, it grew in a very painfully slow speed, hmm. right? Um, and and uh, I think when India tries to do this sub-regional, to, to uh, promote the sub-regional uh, uh, cooperation, uh, you need to be mindful and, and look at why in some other places around the region, this is going in very, very slow, right? Yeah. And, and the last thing is, uh, Look, ASEAN was top-bottom uh, process in the sense of political leaders and vision, the community of Southeast Asia. Uh, and to be honest, we're having a hard time, and I'm sorry to be a bit controversial about this, uh, a bit of hard time grounding ASEAN to the public. What I'm saying is this, my, my, my foundation, uh, we did some research and so on, and you know, f we found that less than 1% of Indonesians know what ASEAN community is, mm. right? And, you know, I would ask ASEAN leaders the same questions. They would say the same. You know, mm. I would be surprised if, uh, in some places it's over 10%, right? right? Uh, and even 1% for Indonesia, which means uh, 20 mil 25 million people, uh, sorry, uh, two and a half million people, that's still way too much right. for people to understand it, right? So uh, for this BIMSTEC uh, to work out political model of top bottom is important but unless you can capture the bottom up process right it's not going to be the uh, you know that's the real challenge right there right uh, and it takes a lot of political imagination and and statecraft to to devise that yeah, yeah. thank you um, let me just ask Stephen had mentioned um the possibility of a uh, india indonesia australia either trade agreement or framework of some kind. Do you think that's possible? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. 
uh, yes, it's, uh, you know, Indonesia, Australia, uh, we're already uh, uh, working on, 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 on a SIPA, yeah? yeah. Uh, uh, so it's just an easy thing to add one more chapter at India. Yes, yes. Uh, except one thing, uh, again, I'm sorry to say this, uh, Indonesia, India, economic cooperation, especially in terms of trying to get an FTA, uh, is, is going to be harder than Indonesia, Australia. Uh, for some reason, I don't know what it is, the dynamics of our co cooperation has centered more on political uh, yeah. and, and strategic, uh, yeah. more so than, than economic and free trade uh, issues. Yeah. Got it. Aaron, let me, let me shift gears a little bit. I mean, one of the tragic things we've seen come out of Australia over the last few weeks and months has been the impacts uh, from the fires and the impacts of, of climate change on Australia and on the, on the population. Um, and I just wonder if we can connect that subject uh, to this subject of connectivity as a, as a risk uh, to economic connectivity uh, in the region and I just wonder how you see that and, and kind of whether we need to be thinking about climate change as we think about this challenge of connectivity. Yes, I'll, I'll do my best. Yeah. <laughs> I think that, um, you know, with what we've seen in Australia right now, I mean, climate change and, and the, the consequences, this, this is a genuinely global problem. It requires global solutions and we're seeing the impact, well, the, I guess, the, like I said, the consequences play out in Australia right now. Um, but in order to deal with climate change, however you wish to define that, and that's probably controversial in itself, is that you actually need to have strong mechanisms to be able to do that. So whether it is SARC, whether it is BIMSTEC, whether it's ASEAN, um, we need to be actually ha have the, those strong mechanisms to be able to have that conversation and that dialogue and come up with truly not only regional but global solutions. Um, I was thinking about the economic impact um, and the real question is none of these conversations here matter if we are going to have this kind of impact from climate change because there's go not going to be an economy uh, unless we actually deal with climate change as well. Um, so that's something that's been on, on my mind a little bit. We, a couple of days ago, I think it was Tuesday, we were invited to the Coalition of Disaster Resilient Infrastructure. And this is a, a new coalition that Australia is a founding member of and um, that is India-led, which is a real, uh, I guess, testament to India's desire to show leadership on this issue, but how do you actually uh, meet the infrastructure demands of the region, but do it in a way that doesn't contribute to, uh, to accelerating climate change, and in a way that, we, that can be funded appropriately as well? Um, and on that funding issue, one of the other big things I've been thinking about is how what's happened in Australia with this just it's catastrophic, it's unprecedented in Australia. And I think from a, um, a leadership perspective, it's something that our leaders in their lifetime haven't had to deal with an issue as big as this. So we're sort of trying to navigate our way through that as well. How do we actually deal with a crisis like this? Because 30 years of un uninterrupted economic growth means that you know th this is a unique leadership challenge. Um, but what we've seen is it's not only Australian resources that get diverted and the, the economic, like, the budget, what, what that means for our budget, but also it's the United States resources get diverted to Australia, Canada's resources, um, Papua New Guinea, France, we're seeing money coming in from Vanuatu and all kinds of places. So it's not only Australia dealing with this and, and, and Australia having to um, fund the recovery it's all of these other states as well, whether they're in the region or, or outside of the Indo-Pacific, however you want to define it. So I think that we need to make sure, again, those mechanisms are in place, strong regional organisations that can at least have that dialogue and come up with solutions, um, because at the end of the day, we're not going to have an economy if we don't deal with it. Yeah, it's, it's a fascinating point because sometimes I think especially, I mean, we have this debate in the United States about the politics of climate change and either you're pro-development or you're, you know, pro-combating climate change. And 
and your point is there is no development if you don't address the climate change issues. I wonder, could you just say a little bit about the politics of what's happening uh, or what has happened in Australia and what other countries might, might take from that? Sure. Uh, the politics of what's happened in Australia has, has been really fascinating to watch unfold because um, and, and every day it's cha evolving, I, I think, how political leaders are dealing with this. So today there's a lot of focus on the media in Australia and how particular media outlets either um, I, I, the way that they will frame these debates and, and how political that is as well. Um, so part of the problem, I think, and I'm trying to choose my words very, very carefully because I know they might come back to bite me one day. Um, no, don't, don't worry. It's not being live streamed and no one's, no one's watching. No one, so, yeah. Don't put it on Twitter. Right. Um, Twitter has real consequences in politics. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we have a situation where our current government, um, you have sort of two sides. You've got the moderate side, which is very pro dealing with climate change, um, and then you've got a very, uh, I don't even want to say it's, it's because it's a more conservative wing, um, because to be conservative would also mean to want to conserve the environment. Uh, it, to be conservative would actually want to look after and, and keep the planet the way it is. So I don't even want to say well, it's because you're conservative, but we have a, a, another part of the party that um, doesn't want to deal with climate change and even today are still on Twitter saying the science isn't settled. Um, so how as a leader in, the, in our Westminster system do you balance those two sides of, of, of your party while also not trying to be thrown out at the next election? So that's a, I think that's a really fine line for the Prime Minister to, to walk, and that's really challenging yeah. um, in Australia. Thank, thank you very much. Um, Sachin, let me, let me turn to you. Um, obviously, the Bay of Bengal and Southeast Asia have played uh, critical roles in Prime Minister Modi's Act East uh, policy. And as you look ahead in, in this year and in the remainder of the Prime Minister's second term, uh, what do you see as some of the key goals and emerging areas of focus uh, for Act East? What are some of the challenges that India faces uh, as it looks to solidify some of its ties with its eastern neighbors and, and promote uh, connectivity? Uh, Ambassador Verma, uh, uh, we heard uh, Dr. Jay Shankar this morning uh, where he tried to capture and, and bring out this uh, new impetus in terms of action-oriented uh, approaches. And uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi delineated it at two different levels. One, in terms of uh, the Act East policy, where uh, projects are to be implemented, and they are to be implemented with a timeline, and identifying uh, uh, the country-led priorities that are there. The second level is uh, more to energize the northeast uh, region of the country, where development uh, was, was really an issue, uh, connectivity was an issue. And here you have, as you mentioned in the uh, initial remark of yours, uh, uh, how we uh, connect with the uh, ASEAN countries that are in the neighborhood, be that Thailand or, or Myanmar. And here uh, the idea was in terms of uh, pumping in resources to connect India's Northeast with the Act East. And, and how do you achieve that? So a couple of initiatives have been uh, launched. They are part of the uh, initiatives led by the Asian Development Bank. Uh, Prime Minister was also very keen that when uh, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, AIIB, uh, is hosting its board meeting in uh, India, it should also go to Gohati, Nassam, mm. and see how we are going to bring in the whole dimension of uh, infrastructure, people-to-people -people connect with uh, the uh, neighboring countries of Myanmar and, and Thailand and go further up. In fact, uh, if you look at the trilateral highway which is being built from uh, Thailand, Myanmar to India, now the studies are on and my own uh, Institute RIS is engaged with area in this to see how we can extend that up to Laos and Cambodia and, and then eventually to, to, to Vietnam. 
So this kind of effort in terms of providing impetus to infrastructure building, trying to provide impetus to people to people connect, and then of course the banking and finance. In fact, when Prime Minister was in Shangri-La dialogue, uh, one of the side meetings that he attended was to uh, energize the uh, FinTech uh, connect within the region with ASEAN. And that I think is absolutely essential because if you have to provide Philip to uh, economic activities, you require the uh, uh, heft of the banking uh, linkages, the uh, financial sector connect. And that I think uh, uh, has given the, the possible direction to the whole idea of uh, seamless flow uh, uh, between South Asia and Southeast Asia. In fact, if you see, uh, this was also connected in the UFA BRICS summit where Prime Minister uh, articulated India's commitment for uh, connect between West Asia, Central Asia, South Asia and Southeast Asia. So if that has to happen, what kind of uh, issues and there I take you back to the whole effort of bringing in Chabahar to connect to Central Asia, the effort of uh, our linkage maybe now with air connectivity with Afghanistan and then of course within South Asia and Southeast Asia. India's own Northeast here plays an extremely important role. Mm -hmm. uh, today, Dr. Jai Shankar also explained uh, efforts in terms of connecting through gas pipelines and others. The other dimension is to connect the eastern coast uh, uh, ports that are important. Somehow, India overlooked the importance of ports uh, on, on the eastern coast. And, and for that, Sagarmala was launched. Uh, uh, the inland waterways with, uh, with uh, West Bengal and, and Bangladesh, starting right from Ganges, that I think is also another important dimension. So inland waterways, air connectivity, the Sagarmala for developing the ports, and then eventual uh, 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 trade and uh, uh, trade facilitation measures that are required. So this all has given uh, the, the holistic framework that is needed to move forward with uh, uh, what uh, uh, Ambassador Demo mentioned about uh, BIMSTAC and, and they, India is playing an extremely important role as Sri Lanka takes over the summit presidency for uh, BIMSTAC. The efforts are now on in terms of how do we go forward in terms of integration through uh, the trading arrangement, through uh, uh, the uh, collective understanding on, uh, uh, on climate change as Erin very rightly pointed out because if you see uh, uh, there was a speech very interesting speech by Nepal's Prime Minister at the last uh, BIMSTEC summit uh, where he pointed out what happens in uh, uh, the waters when Sri Lanka or uh, Bangladesh are moving in Indian Ocean it affects uh, Himalayan glaciers and uh, uh, the accelerated melting actually affects Nepal so the interdependence within the region is becoming more and more pronounced yeah no, those are those are really important observations. But I, you're talking about all the positive that can flow from an increased connectivity. Let me let me challenge you a little bit about the negative consequences of inner of inner con connectivity as well. As you increase these access points and trade routes, you get some of the negatives from a security perspective whether that's narcotics or extremism or terrorism, risk to the, to the country. How do, you, how do you balance all of the increased connections which are positive with some of the risks that may be associated as well? Or yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you. Uh, in fact, if you look at uh, the mutual confidence building measures that have been initiated in the past, uh, when India and Myanmar, India, Bangladesh and India, Bhutan, they could work together in terms of uh, wiping out most of the dissenting uh, groups and particularly challenging uh, uh, the, the independence and autonomy in the regions which are uh, uh, close to these countries in the uh, northeastern states of India. And as we see uh, more and more uh, such destabilizing efforts have been on in the South Asian region for last 30 years or so. And that I think uh, would have to be counterbalanced by the development uh, dividend that, that we are uh, looking at. In fact, uh, uh, we have suggested that for our uh, collective commitment for sustainable development goals, probably more uh, uh, pragmatic and positive approaches would reduce uh, the development descent that we see, marginalization that we see, 
and exclusions that we are seeing in this part of the world. And I think South Asia, uh, to be out of the poverty trap, to be out of the hunger, probably we would have to be uh, very active on, on development dividends. Yeah, very, very good points. Um, Anuradha, let me, let me turn to you. Um, you know, uh, regional forums play an incredibly important role in, in solidifying connectivity between Southeast Asia and, and South uh, Asia. Sri Lanka brings an exceptionally valuable uh, perspective in this regard through its participation in SARC and the ASEAN uh, Regional Forum. Maybe you could give us your sense of perspective from Sri Lanka. How do you assess the opportunities for greater regional cooperation and and what are some of the, uh, the challenges and, and how do these opportunities contrast with those stemming from greater engagement with China and its Belt and Road Initiative? So a lot there to <laughs> That's true. Think um, about. I'll try my best as well. Um, well, the government that has recently come into power has stressed um, very much as a priority uh, the need to strengthen Asian institutions as you mentioned SAC and ASEAN and even the non-aligned movement um, they've specifically mentioned that that is a priority for them and in recent years I think we may all agree and we had a small discussion at dinner as well in terms of how uh, institutions like SAC are not as active as you know it once used to be and perhaps we could um, you know it could benefit the entire region if some of these institutions were uh, further strengthened uh, for what we we believe would be collective and mutual uh, benefit for the uh, for the entire region. Um, and the one other thing that we're really uh, sort of um, thinking in the back of our minds, we have so many commonalities when you talk about the region in, in terms of the historical ties that we share, the cultural ties that we share, even some of the religious ties that we share. So why not use these as uh, strengths, you know, to build greater, uh, greater bonds rather than uh, points of conflict. And you asked about certain um, opportunities and I do Obviously, there are many, but I wanted to quickly touch, up, touch upon just four. I won't go into too much detail because sure. of time, maybe, if there is time later on. But obviously, trade and investment, like um, the others have uh, spoken about, which uh, Sri Lanka is at a point where, obviously, because of you know things like the Easter attacks last year, um, some inst instability with the previous regime as well, you know, we are having uh, our growth really came... Uh, you know, I don't want to say it to a standstill, but it really struggled. So that's one of our key priorities now to encourage investment and trade, um, particularly within the region, you know, to help us uh, increase that growth rate uh, in the years to come. Um, also security, as was mentioned uh, before, where, you know, with the Easter attacks, again, we saw... Uh, we were really shocked by the Easter attacks because we went for nearly 10 years without a terrorist incident after the war ended. And we, I think, uh, to our fault, we became somewhat complacent, thinking that another terrorist incident you know, couldn't occur because we were just going on with our lives. And then this happened, and it was a, a real trigger in terms of making us think that the ISIS problem is not secluded to one region, but it's, it's, gonna, it's going to affect all of us. And we really have to address those issues as, as, as a region as well. And then I think this was further cemented when uh, President Gotabe Rajapaksha came to India a couple of months ago. Uh, Prime Minister Modi extended 50 million US dollars to fight uh, counterterrorism, which I think um, you know, indicates that both countries have identified this as a problem that must be addressed uh, in, in collaboration. And we hear many of the other countries that come to speak to both the president and the prime minister, counterterrorism is always, almost always a topic that is discussed as a priority. And then the two others is one is, um, I agree with you, uh, Aaron, in terms of climate change. As an island nation, we face very unique challenges when it comes to climate and we have seen that this past year with you know unpredictable rainfall patterns you know that really wreaked havoc in, in terms of the agricultural sector and um, other sectors as well and you know we need very unique um, approaches to handling climate change as a small island nation but we also need assistance from the region in terms of technical expertise for example uh, to draw up these unique um, solutions to to our climate change problems and then very quickly I, I did want to mention um, the gender in, uh, aspect of it, which, you know, we're still struggling in terms of gender inclusion in a number of sectors, whether it comes to education or politics or, you know, a number of other sectors, and I'm sure other countries um, share this view as well. And learning from other, you know, learn, learning lessons from other countries in the region because of those shared values, as you 
expressed, whether it's cultural or whether it's religious. You know, sometimes we understand ourselves better than in the region um, rather than trying to, uh, you know, come up with strategies working with people who might not have those shared values um, that, that we hold, you know, in, in commonality. I think it's a, it's a really powerful point, and I, I'm, I'm glad you raised it. I want to ask you and, and maybe all the panelists to think about uh, the China challenge. China, I did forget, forget yeah. to mention and, that. And uh, how Sri Lanka has dealt with that. There's been obviously a lot written and talked about yeah. the, the port in the development of the port in Sri Lanka by the Chinese and whether that ultimately was a good or bad uh, deal. Um, but, but how much of what we're talking about here is really trying to create an alternative to Belt and Road, a different model with different rules? Are, are we talking about something, is this a different architecture? How have you dealt with that in Sri Lanka? And for, for the audience, I am sure you're comparing your questions about what you're going to answer, uh, what you're going to ask. Um, so I, I just ask, we're only here for the next 30 minutes. So if you could, if you could draw your attention to the participants, that would, be, that would be appreciated. So go ahead. Thank you. So China obviously does play a role. I don't think um, we need to deny that in Sri Lanka because it has huge investments uh, in Sri Lanka um, infrastructure projects as well. Uh, but I think if you, um, I hesitate to say this, whether you know certain parts of the media, maybe the international media has disproportionately um, covered that particular relationship. Uh, if you look uh, historically, we've had very strong ties, whether it's investment or aid or otherwise, with countries like India, which is our closest ally as well, um, Japan, even the United States, you know, these have been historically uh, strong partnerships uh, with Sri Lanka. It's just the, the post-war situation created a, a situation where we had to uplift these communities with some of the very basic needs, for example, roads. We didn't have a road to go up. I mean, some of you who have been to Sri Lanka will know traveling from Colombo to the central part of Kandy is still a struggle. We still don't have that, we don't have that highway built. We're struggling with that. We don't have a highway route to Jaffna, you know? So these the just basic necessities are, uh, or what people needed immediately after the conflict, which is why the government at the time felt like we needed to, you know, turn to people who would be able to help us. So that was just the reality of the time. But then, you know, we still continue to get assistance from all these other partner partners that we have had for a very, very long time. So that's why I said, you know, tend to say maybe there was a bit of a disproportionate coverage in terms of how people looked at the China Sri Lanka relationship. But one indication, President Gotabe Rajapaksha made his first uh, official foreign visit to India, which I think was uh, symbolically very important to show that this relationship as well is quite important. Yeah. Stephen, what do you, what do you think? Uh, is this about an alternative to Belt and Road? Can China be part of uh, India's Act East policy, or, or um, are we really talking about two different architectures and two different systems? Well, I don't think we're talking about two different architectures or two different systems at the moment, but we may well be driven to that by the strategic competition between the United States and China. Um, Australia's been dealing with China since 1972. So we recognised China in December 1972 with the One China policy, and Australia was one of the countries like the United States, like India, like many countries, who welcomed China's introduction into the world, and we've seen China take hundreds of millions of people out of poverty and become the largest trading partner of nearly 200 countries around the world. I think the challenge we face with China now is that the China that Australia and other countries dealt with from 1972 until 2012, 2013, 2014 is not the China we're dealing with now. So China is now a changed China from that period where China entered into the global economy um, in the context of what you can describe as the Deng Xiaoping consensus or Bob Zelik's responsible stakeholder thesis. A much more assertive China, a China which says that if it determines that something is a Chinese core interest, it will brook not only no conversation with that, it will either economically or politically, uh, impliedly or expressly threaten people who try to take a contrary view. And there are also very significant values questions arising out of China's treatment of the Uyghurs. So we're dealing with a changed China. And that's what is now causing the difficulty for 
whether it's United States, whether it's uh, Australia, whether it's India, whether it's Sri Lanka. At the same time, we have now great policy uncertainty in arising from the United States, and this adds to the difficulties and the dilemmas. And in, in both those contexts, uh, a theme which has been either implicit or expressed by all members of the panel has been we now face challenges which no one country can deal with alone. And that's what, in my view, drives the strategic notion of the Indo-Pacific, which is in a context of superpower strategic competition or Cold War with economic characteristics, it makes sense for other countries to seek a multipolar world. And that's why it makes sense for other countries to say, well, if we're going to be faced with an assertive China and strategic competition between the two superpowers, it makes sense to talk to other nations and particularly it makes sense to encourage a multipolar world. And that's why the emergence of India, of, in, of Indonesia, India is a great power, Indonesia is a global influence, not just a regional influence. The emergence of other multi, multipolar centres makes it easier for us to try and grapple with these very difficult questions. We, in the end, we may, we may well be driven to essentially a, uh, a, 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 a two, a two uh, or two system or a du duopoly. And part of what drives that is that in the modern era, we are also entirely at the mercy of, of the digital world and data and the dangers of two systems in that respect. So we may well be driven there. Uh, we're not there yet. And key to avoiding that is for all of us to be urging both China and the United States to resolve their strategic competition issues, but also to argue to China that what it is doing on a whole range of fronts causes smaller countries consternation, both political and economic, and it's not actually in China's long-term interest to conduct itself in the way in which it's conducting itself now. Yeah, thank you. Um, Dino, maybe um, your view from, from Indonesia just about you know, how you see the, the China both opportunity and the, the threat in terms of, of connectivity. Yeah, well, the, the Southeast Asian members of uh, BIMSTEC, which is Thailand and Myanmar, uh, the number one trading partner is China. And I'll be honest with you, uh, I think most of Southeast Asia see China as the real game. Right, uh, the real deal. Because what, do you, what do you mean by that? They, uh, sorry, be, uh, it means that China has the resources uh, to spend uh, on Southeast Asia, right? Uh, despite the shortcomings and so on. Right. So what I'm saying is, look, if India is serious about BIMSTEC, and BIMSTEC can only survive if India leads it, because India has the resources to do so, uh, I think the challenge is, India needs to up the game, right? Uh, to 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 match, uh, you know, what China is is is, is offering. Because to a lot of uh, the Southeast Asians, uh, the question is, in the mindset is, we want to get all the pies. You know, we want to get the Chinese pie, the Japanese pie, the American pie, the Indian pie. Right, uh, they think a bit differently in, in the sense that they don't have certain complexes as some other countries uh, do, right? Uh, so, but, but on the other side, I think some countries are worried about getting too dependent on China, right? And for Indonesia, for example, you know, China is our biggest trading partner, number three investment, definitely the number one tourist now. Uh, exceeding the Americans and, and uh, the, the Japanese and, and Singaporeans and so on. Uh, but uh, Indonesia also wants to spread our bets, right? Uh, we still want the Americans uh, to be as close as uh, can be. Uh, and uh, we are very interested in the Indian uh, side as we, uh, you, know, uh, you know, balance the relationship uh, with China and so on. So, yeah. so the, the, the interest uh, is there, right? But uh, definitely, I think whether or not they say it or not, uh, there's a perception in many Southeast Asian countries that uh, the country with the real uh, resources uh, to, to spend 
uh, is, is now China. That's, that's, you know, yeah, it's, it's a great observation. I wonder, Aaron, if you want to comment on that as well. And also, just curious for any of the panelists, uh, whether, whether you think the United States has a role to play here in offsetting uh, what China is offering or, or whether really we're not part of the um, equation. Thanks, Rich. Um, yeah, so we've all agreed that we've got global challenges and we need to have global or regional, interregional solutions. But with the way the economy is going in so many different places right now, including India, um, and you know what economic consequences there are in Australia from the bushfires yet to be seen, um, you know that that actually threatens multilateralism because you'll right. see an increase in protectionist policies coming from yeah. governments, particularly in our democracies, where people need to win elections. So uh, politicians need to be seen to be protecting jobs and industries within, within that country. So I think that that's um, one of the big threats here to, this, to, to multilateralism and, and, and cooperation. The other point that I just wanted to touch on was something that you actually raised about the media and how the media talks about the, the US-China uh, competition. And I wanted to give a little bit of insight um, from the experience I've had with working with the media in Australia. Um, the, every, t every TV or uh, I guess broadcaster who works in this space, everyone wants to just talk about, they obsess about the US and China. And it's almost like you can't get an op-ed up or you can't um, talk on a particular topic unless it is sort of couched in the US-China issue. An example, I, I published an op-ed on Lowy, you know, the interpreter, um, on uh, the warships, the, the Chinese warships that came into Sydney Harbour, a, a typical showing of the flag exercise, timing wasn't great. Um, and it ended up being the most read article on Lowy that weekend. Wow. Now, I'm not a China expert. I'm not a naval expert. Um, but just this sort of slight observation I'd made about, about it ended up being the most read article. So, so it's not only the media that's obsessed by it, but the people consuming the media are obsessed by it as well. So I think that's a real challenge because you've sort of got to work through the noise that's there to actually find out what's going on. It was really not an issue that these ships had turned up, but it was headline news for days. Yeah, and, you know, observations of the, the, the um, baby milk formula. So a lot of the sailors got off the ship and bought a whole bunch of Australian baby milk formula, and this was front page news that uh, Chinese sailors had bought Australian milk baby, and, and, and therefore, the, you know, in Australia, we were going to have a shortage of baby formula. It was yeah. crazy. Yeah. But that's the kind of um, you, you know, hype you get around it. Well, it's, it's an important point, and, and Sachin, um, you have similar challenges here, right? I mean, I think Aaron's point is, how do you encourage connectivity, multilateralism, in an era where globalization is a bad word, where uh, nationalism is on the rise everywhere, US, India, South America, can, can you have nationalism with a degree of protectionism and connectivity and this, these grand ambitions simultaneously? Uh, first, uh, Rich, I think I, let me bring you back to your uh, question on China yeah. and, and, and let me uh, take that up first. Uh, I think uh, at this point, uh, as you travel across Southeast Asian countries and even in South Asia, you see a sort of anxiety and, and I think uh, as uh, 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 Ambassador Dino also articulated, it is important for us to see that there is this anxiety to balance China. Uh, balance China with alternative uh, initiatives, bring in uh, alternative actors and, and provide that uh, solution, be that for infrastructure development, be that for trade, but basically bring in governance, governance in, 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 in ocean because, because that's where and, and obviously the reference comes back to uh, the, the Indo-Pacific and I, I go back to your question whether the US has a role 
and that's where I think uh, uh, India, US, uh, Australia, Japan, the Quad's role comes in here in terms of the governance of waters here, in terms of governance of the ocean resources, be that for deep sea mining, fishing, the trawlers that are there, the Chinese trawlers that are there, the, the energy, the offshore energy uh, uh, sort of sequencing. So here you require a sort of balancing factor and that anxiety actually has multiplied as the projects with the BRI have gone up. So what you need here now uh, is, is also uh, uh, the whole effort like for instance the Asia-Africa Growth Corridor, the discussion that was initiated uh, immediately uh, 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 the, the comparisons in media about uh, 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 India, Japan coming together to challenge China, BRI versus uh, Asia-Africa Growth Corridor etc etc so this has really frightened our uh, think tank partners in Japan <coughs> and they have tried to come up with this idea that let's call it FOIP let's call it uh, uh, the the Asia Africa partnership within the Indo-Pacific framework and do not use the word corridor because then that comes up uh, mm. uh, as a uh, challenger to uh, to BRI so here uh, my point is that uh, the idea of uh, balancing and out of anxiety has multiplied and so you require some of the actors to come together to see that we address it duly. Second, uh, in terms of the infrastructure, trade expansion, connectivity, the point that you raised at the end, I think it rec also requires our collective approach about sustainability how we grow with less carbon footprint. Mm. We can't emit it US strategy, we can't emit it Europe. So the developing Asia would have to see how we bring in and they, that's where we borrow uh, the Japanese concept of quality infrastructure. That's where you think in terms of reducing the carbon footprint of the whole growth process. Really, really good points. Um, Anurata, let me ask you a question then I'd like to open it up for questions from the, uh, from the audience. Um, it's interesting, Sachin mentioned uh, India, Japan, Australia, you know, a, uh, a number of other countries that have one thing in common, which is their democracies. Um, and again, back to this question about how, how important is that to the connectivity uh, question about shared values? And I don't know if it has to be a community of democracies or not, but can we have connectivity based on ideas, which really did connect this region for 2,000 years uh, or so? It's really in the last 100 years that we talk about the hard infrastructure issues. But, but talk a little bit of, about this commonality in, in thought and basic ideas on laws of the seas or resolving disputes peacefully. How important is that to this conversation? Um, I mean, I think it's very important. And, uh, you know, let's not forget Sri Lanka is one of the oldest democracies in the region as well. So, you know, again, when it comes to media coverage, as um, Aaron pointed out, perhaps because of our recent conflict uh, past, we've been, you know, sort of framed in this, uh, this media frame of, you know, perhaps being an undemocratic uh, country or these words like, you know, being autocratic or, you know, various uh, words or descriptive words have been used to describe um, certain regimes, which uh, I'm not sure is, is, is quite fair because if you look at re recent elections and even historical elections, we've had elections perhaps more so than even the U.S., right, which is not always a good thing when it's, uh, when it's not uh, in a sustainable fashion, but then, you know, our system so we have always had elections and they've always sort of transitioned uh, even during some of the most violent parts of our history uh, if you remember chandrika uh, president chandrika was had an assassination attempt on her nearing elections yet elections went forward um, in 2015 people thought president rajapaksha would not leave office and stay forcefully that did not happen uh, he in fact uh, left his official residence even before elections were uh, the final results were declared then president maithripala sirisena 
peacefully, you know, transition from one to another. Um, so we've always had, you know, democratic values that have, of course, I'm not saying it's perfect, it's not a perfect democracy, or there's um, always, you know, room for improvement. But I think when you're especially talking about the uh, China factor, it, it one, one reason I think perhaps we, you know, seem to have sort of leaned more towards that at certain times was it, be, it became an alternative. Whereas if you're talking about the U.S. and certain other countries where they placed sometimes uh, unrealistic condition for a post-conflict uh, period, then China became an alternative, you know, whereas I think that perhaps, but I think that I sense that the tone is changing a little bit on both fronts, whether uh, from the Sri Lankan uh, government side, as well as, you know, some of the U.S. dignitaries that we have spoken to so far, there's more of a willingness to work together, um, I feel, so I'm hopeful for the, for the future. Thank you. Let me, let me see if there are questions from the audience. I'm told you have um, microphones. I see uh, two hands. Why don't we go right here first. Yeah, good evening. Um, Harry Batita, um, Asia Global Institute. Just a, a two very brief questions. One is uh, uh, to Mr. Chaturvedi, and the question is, how can you organize connectivity in the Bay of Bengal if a major player, the major player, uh, is a relatively reluctant free trader? Put differently, um, India seems to be seems to be driven, uh, seems to perceive trade from a producer's perspective and not from a co consumer's perspective. That makes it very difficult to embrace an open trade regime and the trade is in the, uh, the title of our, of, our, of our meeting here. Um, so how can, how can that happen? How can free trade be a core element of um, the Bay of Bengal connectivity. I have a second question to uh, Stephen Smith and that is uh, due to the relatively uh, late night uh, meeting that we have. Uh, a bit of a tongue-in-cheek question. Uh, you have been relatively critical of China if I'm not misunderstanding your assessment of the situation. Um, can you envisage um, how Australia would fare in 2020 if the outcome of the 2016 election in the United States of America would have been different? Uh, if I may ask it differently, shouldn't the Australian society, which is currently having a very strong ally um, in the confrontation with China, shouldn't the, America, shouldn't the Australian population be more grateful to the current American administration not willing to name the person I'm referring to. Thank you. Can I, maybe I'll just take the last part of that first, which is if my recollection is that Australia had a pretty good relationship with President Obama as well, just that's my, um, my recollection on that. But Sachin, why don't you go, um, why don't you go first? I, I could not have agreed more with you. I uh, had a think tank, uh, uh, RIS, which focuses on trade analysis and we are fully in favor of uh, India opening up and getting into the trade agreements. Uh, in fact, uh, if you go on our website, you would see several studies done by my institute where we have uh, recommended government to undertake and, and uh, go for more commitments, particularly in context of uh, RCEP. Uh, but some of the uh, partners, if you were referring to RCEP and you had RCEP in mind in uh, context of East Asia, they also would have to appreciate the possibility of India balancing this uh, because some of them started uh, regional integration much earlier than, than India. Uh, uh, in, in principle, I, I fully agree with you and I think India would have to see and, and probably as uh, uh, Dr. Jaishankar mentioned this morning, the doors are not closed. We are very hopeful that India would be part of uh, RCEP and, and we would join that. Stephen? Well, Australia's had yeah. a Sorry, may I ask a question, please? Hold on. Over here, right at the end. We, we, have to, we didn't answer the, the China question, so go ahead, and then we'll come back to you. Well, Australia's had a strategic uh, alliance with the United States, a military alliance with the United States uh, since the end of World War II, uh, and that served Australia's national security interests very well. And uh, since we formed and created that alliance relationship. We've worked with every United States government of whatever political persuasion, as we do with, uh, with uh, uh, any other country. We allow them to determine who their government is and we deal with them accordingly, particularly when it comes to democracy. So, um, like most people in Australia, I got the outcome of the last US presidential election wrong 
uh, any pundit in Australia who tells you that they got it correctly is, uh, is uh, rewriting history. Um, I, my own instinct is that the president will be re-elected, but you know, democracies always throw up surprises. The challenge Australia has is to balance a strategic military security alliance relationship with the United States and a uh, comprehensive economic relationship with China. Uh, I've been critical of China because China is a changed China, it's a more assertive China, and it doesn't brook conversations on difficult issues where it has a predetermined view. And that is not, in my view, meeting the ideal which China has itself set out in uh, recent decades, which is one of mutual respect and mutual trust. If you have a partner who won't listen to your conversations, it's not mutual respect. And that's the changed environment now that we all have to deal with. And uh, Session spoke about balance. And the reason we need to have balance is because countries, whether it's Australia or Sri Lanka, can't live in a might is right world. And so the ongoing presence of the United States, both economically and in a security sense, in North Asia, Southeast Asia and South Asia, is, in my view, essential. And if I can just make a point about balance and a multipolar world, D Dino used the phrase that Southeast Asia sees China as the real deal in terms of resources. The reason we talk now about the Indo-Pacific is because we live in a changing world. The combined population of India and Indonesia is currently greater than China, and India has a better, by itself, has a better demography and age demographic than China. By the time we get to any point in the cycle between 2040 and 2050, on current projections, the combined India and Indonesian economies will be much larger than the China economy of today and larger than the Chinese economy of 2040 to 2050. So those people who think that the only economic opportunity there is is China is not looking at the economic opportunities which are emerging in the Bay of Bengal and in the Indo-Pacific, courtesy of India and Indonesia. And in terms of an ongoing presence of the United States, why would any of us in North Asia, Southeast Asia or South Asia think that it would make sense to rebuff the country which, is, which continues to be the most sophisticated technological uh, economic developer in the world and who in 2050 on a bad day is going to be the third largest economy? Why would we rebuff that? Good points. Uh, question in the back of the room. Yeah. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, my name is K.V. Rajan. Uh, I had two questions. Maybe it is the distance from the stage. Uh, my table is somewhat far off from the stage or uh, my advanced age or the uh, chatter over red wine at various tables. But I didn't hear any mention of RCEP. Uh, is that because of... Uh, uh, a feeling that this is an excessively sensitive subject for our Indian hosts or, I mean, what on earth are all the 15 countries which are members of RCEP and India going to do to make sure that India is as much in line with RCEP as possible, as soon as possible? And the second question is, I think the three self-evident truths are uh, that India cannot hope to achieve its true potential unless the rest of South Asia also uh, is able to rise. Secondly, that SARC is in uh, ICU. And, uh, you know, recently there was an IMF report which said that uh, South Asia could be the growth engine for Asia and India could lead the way. Now, how can this happen unless India and all its friends can come together and see the growth, rapid growth of South Asia, which includes, you know, the interests of youth, women, skill development, etc. All that as a strategic necessity in the next decade or so. I just wanted to draw out the views of the panel on these two points. Thank you. Sachin, you want to you wanna jump in on uh, RCEP? Yeah, and I, I thought we just uh, responded to this idea of uh, RCEP, and I agree, Ambassador Rajan, with you <coughs> that it is extremely sensitive issue. And of course, uh, uh, the, uh, the question that was there in terms of producer perspective, 
dominating the Indian narrative on free trade agreements is something that all of us are grappling with in the country. We are concerned about it, and, and I think uh, uh, the partners would, uh, uh, would, would respond the way uh, uh, Australia and, uh, and Japan have in terms of uh, being more considerate in terms of this. Uh, the bilateral discussions with China are also on in terms of redefining some of the terms. I hope uh, by March or April we would have more clarity uh, whether the door is really open in terms of we going forward. But of course, uh, uh, the geopolitics is such that uh, uh, the, the efforts to block in India's entry on, on specific uh, uh, negotiating tracks are already on. So uh, on both sides, we are having uh, uh, positive and negative developments. I hope uh, negotiators from India would, would succeed and we would probably be in, in RCEP. That's what my impression is. Mm. Stephen? Yeah. Can I um, proffer what is probably a minority of one view in Australia and, and p potentially controversial? Um, I was last in India in September of last year and I made the point uh, when I was here on my last occasion that from a strategic pers 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 perspective it would be a better outcome for the, the strategic uh, implications for the Indo-Pacific if, if RCEP was delayed and ultimately RCEP included India right. rather than RCEP being struck as an arrangement in India's absence. I look at RCEP, the RCEP outcome in a from a completely different vantage point than most people do. I regard where we are with RCEP now as a failure of ASEAN, Japanese and Australian diplomacy. ASEAN, in particular Indonesia and Singapore, Japan and Australia, should not have allowed it to get to this point. Dr Jaishankar this morning said that he regarded RCEP as a trade agreement and you make economic judgments. To some extent or a large extent that's right, but trade agreements in a region also bring with them strategic implications. And the strategic implications of RCEP without India are as adverse as the strategic implications of the Trans-Pacific Trade Agreement without the United States. Right. So we're about to walk into the night with the perverse situation where the United States is not in the Trans-Pacific Trade Agreement and India is not in RCEP. Neither of these outcomes are in our strategic interests and if Australia, Indonesia and ASEAN and Japan had been more adroit, the, the, worst, the, the, the worst position we would currently be in would be a dedicated pathway and process which would enable India to come into our step in a timely manner. It's not enough for India's partners to say, we're going to close the deal and when you're ready, you can think about coming in. You know, trade agreements are like buses in the night. If you don't sign up when the opportunity is there, often the bus never comes around in the thick of the fog. And so people should not assume that if we sign up RCEP now in India's absence, that somehow magically down the track, India will come in. Just as we shouldn't assume that somehow magically down the track, the United States will come into the TPP. Yeah, it's interesting. Both the United States and India now find itself uh, slightly isolated well, it, uh, it, and deliberately so. It, Interesting yeah. and strategically adverse for all of us. I, I share that view uh, strongly. I think we are, unless someone is desperate for a question, we really are out of time, but so let's make this yeah. quick and then we'll right. have 30 second uh, response and then we'll wrap up. Okay, I'm not desperate for a question, but it's, um, <laughs> and I put this in a context of just listening to the uh, fluid fleet with uh, talking about what binds us. And it's the values and all that. Oh, by the way, I'm the, the director of the Daniel K. New Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies in Hawaii. And I heard a lot of you talk about China and looking at the way ahead and partnership and making choices. So let me be quick and I'll ask Anurada on this. Because now you're starting to make choices and where do you go in the future? And you have to assess risk. And I never heard about the risk of making choices with China and where you see some of their actions like in Sri Lanka, in the Hambantotin port and where, and I heard in the plenary session, things that we embrace 
like sovereignty, rules-based order. But in this very, very experienced group, and you guys are talking about opportunities and initiatives, you guys never talked about those risks and what does it bring and how do you deal with it collectively in the region to maintain stability? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for that question. If you, if you yeah, can I, do it in a minute or less. Okay. Though, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, one of the challenges, as you say, uh, one of the biggest challenges, while there are so many potential benefits of this uh, collaboration, is um, managing the relationships, which, as you correctly uh, pointed out, and that's where, as a small emerging uh, nation, that is going to be our biggest risk, where while we need to sort of protect our sovereignty, as you, as, as you rightly pointed out, and as was discussed in other, um, other, uh, other platforms as well, um, how do we still promote this multilater uh, multilateral cooperation while uh, you know, protecting our sovereignty, which has been a challenge for us in the past. And um, the Hambantota report issue is a very complex issue where, you know, the government that I'm, w I'm with had a different uh, plan for the Hambantota report, whereas uh, the previous government implemented a completely different plan, you know, uh, than what we had. So, it, and now we d sort of can't do anything about it because of the situation of the agreement. So that's a very complex issue. But um, I mean, you're absolutely right. That is the challenge that we have. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure I have all the solutions to that. But um, managing those two in terms of protecting our sovereignty uh, while being open to yeah. cooperation. Just you know, a 30 second answer to that. And I like your question. My answer to that would be uh, we take the risk, but we set the terms. So for Indonesia, what we do with China, China offers us Belt and Road. And in fact, uh, President Xi Jinping announced it first in Indonesia and in 2013. Uh, our response is yes, but only in four provinces out of 36. And we set the terms. It has to be this and that. You know, there are like five point terms that I think other countries around the region should look into because it's uh, really terms that protect Indonesia's interests and tries to manage the risks. Let me, let me thank the panel for their really insightful comments. Let me thank all of you for, for hanging in there on a, a late night uh, dinner discussion. Uh, big round of applause for all of our panelists. Thank you.